Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar, Why Should We Prioritize Legal Protections for Aquatic Animals? I'm Lucia Guy, the co-founder and the managing director of the Institute of Animal Law of Asia. Institute of Animal Law of Asia, or ILA, is the educational research center that focuses on animal law issues in Asia and the world. At the ILA, we provide research projects which include animal law in Asian countries on topic animal law articles, on category and on species animal law articles. This year, we have also launched two programs enhancing legal regulations for aquatic animals in Kazakhstan and farmed animal welfare in mainland China. These projects are supported and sponsored by the Center for Animal Law Studies, Lewis and Clark Law School. We also um, have our new source, Asia Animal Law Bulletin, which provides the latest updates on animals in Asian countries and regions. And last year, we have launched the Alliance for Animal Law of Asia, which is an international networking campaign that aims to cooperate with national, regional, and global organizations to improve the awareness and legal protections for animals. You can support the work of the Institute of Animal Law of Asia by donating or sharing our website and materials with uh, friends, family, and colleagues. Recently, we have also launched our shop where you could fund one of our research projects, translation services, or uh, contribute to one of our um, animal law webinars. You can find us on social media by searching I Animal Law Asia on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, and Twitter, and also check out our website, ilasia.org. Today's webinar is organized under my project Enhancing Legal Regulations for Aquatic Animals in Kazakhstan within the Global Ambassador Program launched by the Center for Animal Law Studies, Lewis and Clark Law School. This wouldn't have been possible without the Cal support. Uh, our guest today is Maddie Daw, the campaigner of the Human League UK, the organization working to end the abuse of animals raised for food. Since joining the Human League UK, Maddie has co coordinated hard-hitting corporate and legislative campaigns. In 2020, she started campaigning for better legal protections for farm fish in the UK and working to raise awareness of aquatic animal welfare. We'll be answering questions after the presentation, so please drop your questions in the Q&A box. Thank you so much for speaking for us today, Maddie, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Great, thank you so much, Lou. Um, I will just share my screen, so bear with me one. Okay, can you see that okay? Brilliant, wonderful. All right, thank you so much, um, Lou, for having me here um, today. And thank you so much, everyone, for coming to watch, whether that is in the morning, afternoon, evening for you, um, depending on where you are in the world. So as Lou's already said, my name's Maddie and I work for the Humane League UK and my talk this evening is about why we should prioritise legal protections for aquatic animals. So I just wanted to briefly talk about the charity that I work for, the Humane League. So we have been operating in the United Kingdom since, uh, since 2016 and our mission is to end the abuse of animals raised for food. And specifically, we work to improve the lives of animals within the factory farming system. So in practical terms, what that means is running corporate and legislative campaigns. Historically, we've worked on um, a lot of issues with laying hens and broiler chickens, so chickens raised for meat. But as Lou mentioned, in 2020, we started to advocate for farmed fishes and set about trying to change the law for them in the UK to make sure that they have better protections. And as a campaigner for the Humane League, I've been involved in running all these campaigns um, with my colleagues in the campaigns team since I joined the charity back in January 2020. So I just wanted to um, start the presentation this evening talking a little bit about aquatic animal sentience. So how aquatic animals are intelligent beings with the capacity to feel pain and to suffer. Um, I should say that my particular area of work is specifically about animals farmed for food. So 
The content of this presentation doesn't cover all aquatic animals because I would be talking all night. Um, but the main focus is on fishes and also decapods. So that is lobsters, um, prawns, shrimps and crabs and also cephalopods, so octopuses, squids um, and the like. So there's quite a few myths about aquatic animals that I hope I can start to disprove for you today. And aquatic animals are just so incredibly fascinating. And once you start to delve in and learn more about them, you realize there's so many fascinating facts, but we really don't know much about aquatic animals compared to land-based animals. Only 5% of the oceans have been explored to date. So any learnings that we have, have a long way to go before we know even half about what we do um, for land animals. There's actually over 33,000 different species of fish. And that means that there's more uh, species of fish than there are of mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians all combined. And then when you include all aquatic animals, that estimate goes up to about 1 million. Although, as we've explored so little of the oceans, there could well be many, many more. So I just want to talk a small bit about evolution um, with the help of this deep sea anglerfish. So aquatic animals have, um, and, and particularly fishes, evolved on a separate evolutionary branch to humans. So rather than being less evolved than us, which has often been the traditional view of, of fishes and aquatic animals, they've actually been under evolutionary pressure for the same amount of time, just on a different path. And they've become remarkably adapted to their environment as a, re as a result of this evolution. So if we take the anglerfish, which we can see here on the screen, this is not the most um, pretty fish, and it needn't be because it lives in almost complete darkness. So how do you mate when you're in complete darkness and you're searching for a mate in the size of a football, a space the size of a football stadium, and there's only one female anglerfish to find? Well, in this case, um, evolution has worked really well to, to make this happen. So the male anglerfish is only the size of half an inch and it's quite substantially smaller than its female counterpart. So it also doesn't matter where the um, male anglerfish latches onto on the female's body. As long as it latches on, it will then permanently fuse and then share a blood, su uh, blood supply, nutrients and fertilize her intravenously. And the female anglerfish might end up with three or more males attached to her like this. And this is just a really great example of evolution finding its niche to help that mating happen. Unfortunately, there are still a lot of people who ask the question of whether fishes and other aquatic animals feel pain. And much of that questioning comes down to the fact that there is a misplaced belief that in order to be sentient and conscious, you need a neocortex that's found in mammalian brains. But there's actually a number of reasons why that's wrong. So if we look at birds, birds don't have a neocortex. They instead have something called a paleocortex. And the traditional view was that the bird's brain had evolved and elaborated on an older structure, which is still present in the mammalian brain, but underneath our newly evolved um, neocortex. And I think it's, you know, it's widely recognized that if mammals are conscious, then so are birds, because you know, um, birds display various cognitive feats, such as using tools, remembering locations, categorizing objects, and vocal recognition. So birds really therefore prove that you don't need a neocortex in order to be conscious. So the fish's answer to the neocortex is something called the pallium. And this is extremely diverse and complex. So even though it's got less computing power than the average neocortex, it is increasingly apparent that it functions in a very similar way for fishes. In terms of um, other aquatic animals, so cephalopods and decapods, um, I know a little bit less about the anatomy of their brains and some of them um, 
like octopuses, for example, don't actually have a centralized brain like we do, which makes it very complex for us to understand. But there are many research papers um, online that say that their um, apparatus fulfills a very similar function to what the pallium does. So this indicates that they also can feel pain. And in terms of um, intelligence, I just wanted to um, touch on this small squid that's actually been shown to complete a maze quicker than a dog can. So if you have um, a dog as a companion animal at home and you believe that your dog is um, intelligent and that it has the capacity to feel pain, well, this squid actually um, can complete a maze quicker than that dog. So that's a good way to kind of compare the intelligent levels and really make you think about um, how intelligent aquatic animals could be. There's also the age old question of whether um, fishes feel pain. So there was a study to see if zebrafish would pay a cost for a pain relief whereby in the study they were injected with a painful substance and there was also a group of control fishes and they were injected with a saline solution so that was not painful. Now normally zebrafish prefer enriched environments so tanks with a lot going on, places to hide behind, forage and play. So if they're given the choice between an enriched tank and a barren tank they will always always choose the enriched one. However, in this study, when the zebrafish were given the painful stimulant, they actually chose to go to the barren tank um, with no enrichment when it had pain relief added to the water. And those who were injected with the saline solution, so the control group, went to the enriched tank, which you would expect. And this choice indicates an active need to relieve pain, even when their preference would have been for a different environment. The vision of fishes also works um, somewhat similarly to ours. So they have been proven in an experiment with goldfish to be able to um, understand this optical illusion that we can. So they can perceive the triangle and the square separately, just like a human would be able to. They can complete this incomplete picture. So there's also been an experiment um, into self-perception of fishes. So this experiment has been conducted with animals such as pigs, chimp uh, chimpanzees, elephants, and it indicates whether these animals can recognize their own reflection. And it's actually not until humans are about three or four years old that they can recognize their own, um, that we can recognize our own reflections. So this um, piece of research indicated that fishes can actually recognize and respond to themselves in the mirror. So what you can see here on the screen is a wrasse. And this little wrasse um, was, um, they had a mark placed on the side of their body. And then they were shown a mirror image of themselves. And instead of trying to clean the reflection, they attempted to remove the marks from their own bodies, indicating that they understood that that reflection that they were seeing was them. Um, and yeah, this is a, a test that is done on various species of animals to ascertain levels of intelligence. So that's another one that fishes have managed to um, pass with flying colors. So there's also this myth that um, goldfishes have a three second memory. And this is actually a screenshot of a video from YouTube. And I didn't want to include the video to play because um, we didn't have too much time tonight, but you can find it on, on the internet if you wanted to. This is Spam the goldfish. And Spam has been taught using positive reinforcement to push a ball into the net in order to get a reward. And if for anyone who's a dog owner, um, this is a very similar method that people use with dogs to get them to do a particular behavior. And as the goldfish in this experiment has learned how to do this time and time again in order to get a reward, it just lays waste to this idea that they only have a three second memory. It, it disproves it. And if anyone has a fish at home as a companion animal, you can actually buy training equipment online. So. I would encourage you to give it a go and, uh, and see what happens. 
This is another screenshot from a YouTube video. Um, and this is a tusk fish using a rock as a tool by smashing a clam against it. So it carries this um, clam and looks for an appropriate rock to use to then smash the clam against it and open it up and, and, and eat the insides. And this might sound really basic, but actually it's understood that tool use requires a sophisticated level of cognition. And for a very long time, it had been thought that only humans could use tools until we discovered it in primates. And then since then, we've seen it in mammals, birds, um, cephalopods, and also you can see um, with fishes here too. I also just wanted to briefly touch on the sentience of cephalopods, and I will specifically talk about octopuses in this instance. So octopuses are highly intelligent. They have been shown to kind of exhibit a number of behaviors, and I'll just talk about a couple of them um, this evening. So they um, exhibit anti-predator behavior, so finding creative ways to hide themselves from predators, such as using shells to protect themselves. They've also been shown having social interactions. So octopuses quite frequently will collaborate with fishes and hunt together as a team. Um, they also have the ability to, much like Spam the Goldfish, learn to do tasks in order to receive rewards. And they can open jars and complete mazes. Evidence has been found for the possession of higher brain centers in octopuses. Um, and also they've been demonstrated avoiding painful stimulus and changing their behavior based on painful stimuli, which means again, that um, we can conclude that octopuses are experiencing, experiencing pain and, and feeling suffering. And then just to talk about decapods, so crustaceans, um, there is evidence that crustaceans feel pain that was presented by Professor, uh, Professor Robert Elwood from Queen's University in Belfast. So in 2012, um, Professor Elwood conducted an experiment on European shore crabs. Now, European shore crabs usually find dark, safe places to hide under rocks. They really like hiding in, in these kind of dark, sheltered um, areas. So for this experiment, a group of crabs were placed in a brightly lit tank with two shelters in which to hide. And when they were placed into the tanks, all the crabs scuttled into the dark shelters. However, a randomized group of crabs were administered a small electric shock every five seconds upon entry. And again, there was a control group which did not receive the shock. And this was repeated for several rounds. Now from round two onwards, the group of crabs that received the electric shock were much more likely to switch shelters and that demonstrated that they'd learned to avoid this aversive experience. So from this, we can infer that they had developed memories and experienced the shock as unpleasant enough to decide that they would trade this valuable commodity of a dark, safe shelter for a much brighter and less safe tank, but to avoid the electric shock. And Professor Alward, who did this experiment, said, I don't know what goes on in a crab's mind, but what I can say is that the whole behavior goes beyond a, a reflex response and it fits all the criteria of pain. So there's a lot more evidence out there, um, both scientific and some really nice anecdotal stories as well from fish owners. And I would have loved to go into these if, if we'd had the time, but if you want to learn more about um, fishes and aquatic animals and how sentient and interesting they are, I would really recommend reading this book, um, which is called What a Fish Knows by Jonathan Balcom. It comes really highly recommended from many aquatic animal advocates like myself, um, and it was actually responsible for kind of changing my attitudes towards um, fishes and finding them so interesting. So now I'll just very briefly want to talk a little bit about the different types of systems that aquatic animals are farmed in. Um, this isn't completely extensive, but it just covers the mainly, uh, the most frequently used ones. So we can understand in what ways they are farmed for food um, before talking about some of the welfare implications for that. 
So this is an extensive pond farm. Um, these are widely used in rural populations and many species of um, aquatic, aquatic animal can be farmed in this way. These extensive ponds are um, often used for freshwater fishes, so carp, catfish, pike, and these are maintained in a way that they do foster the development of aquatic fauna. Uh, they're not very intensive, they are a fairly natural environment, and therefore um, production is generally low, which means, unfortunately, um, producers are moving towards more intensive, less realistic systems. Um, but yeah, many of these do still exist in, in more rural, rural areas. There's also semi-intensive systems. So these are normally found in lakes and are basically enclosures placed within the lake. And the production of the aquatic animal is increased by adding supplementary feed, usually in the form of dry pellets. And these systems have higher stocking densities and production because they're enclosed in very tightly and the fishes are fed more. And this is usually used for carp, catfish, prawns and shrimp. More intensive systems are on the rise as the human population has increased and there's a growing middle class in developing countries. So on the whole, the global population, we are eating more aquatic animals. So these systems have been developed to produce as much um, fish as possible. So these more intensive, artificial systems are becoming more co common. And then we get these really intensive systems. So in Europe and the United States, you tend to get systems like this. And these are several open air concrete tanks, raceways or ponds. And it's much more like a production line um, and really goes into the factory farming kind of um, sphere. And they can sometimes have flow through systems, which are um, to kind of recreate a natural passage of water, like a river or a stream. All the systems like this that you can see, and this is a recirculation system where the water remains in a closed circuit and it's recycled um, in tanks using a piping system. Now this can actually be used for all species of fish. Um, so it's commonly used for trout, catfish and eel, um, but yeah, you can use it for um, marine species too. And then finally, there are cages. Um, so sea cages hold aquatic animals captive in large nets, which are anchored to the bottom of the um, lake or, or the sea and kind of maintained on the surface by a framework. And these are quite uh, commonly used for rearing fin fishes. They have also um, started to be used for octopus farming, which I'll talk about a little bit later in this presentation. And they are usually in coastal areas or open waters. Several cages are typically grouped together in rafts and water can flow freely to the cages from the environment surrounding. And the openness of the system means that it's very vulnerable to external influences. So if there is pollution in the surrounding um, sea, that can get through into the cages, unfortunately. And also whatever the animal is creating in the cages can similarly go out into the environment. So that could be waste products or food. And um, so already seeing a, a couple of issues there. But yeah, given all that I have um, kind of spoken about and touched on regarding the sentience of aquatic animals and fishes and their capacity to feel pain, you can probably imagine that there are numerous welfare issues associated with farming aquatic animals in this way. And you would be right about that. So this photo that you can see here is catfish farming. Now, catfish are the most farmed species in the United States, and they're actually very tolerant to low levels of oxygen. And because of this, that unfortunately means that they get um, farmed in very high stocking densities. So as you can see in this picture, the fishes are literally piled on top of one another um, with, with just no space to, to swim around. 
So you might think about um, fishes shoaling, so all swimming in close proximity, and therefore you might think that they're actually fine when they're in close confinement. But shoaling is actually used as a defense mechanism. And fishes do that when they want to stay safe or when they feel threatened. But when fishes aren't shoaling, they like to swim around and investigate their environments, um, forage, play. And in these systems, as you can see, there's just no space for that. So in this example, you can see they're just spending their lives on top of one another. Um, and fishes might touch each other in the wild at specific times. But they don't do this regularly because it can damage the, the outside of their skin. And this is what you see in um, fish farming. So the outside of their bodies, their scales get damaged, their fins get damaged. It's really um, negative for the fish's welfare. Fishes also have a very high um, mortality rate compared to other farmed animals. And in these very intensive systems, unfortunately, there are numerous casualties and losses. And this goes from the, um, the fry stage. So when the fish is a tiny baby fish, right up to when it's um, fully grown and at the time of slaughter. As with any species of animal that is kept in close, um, close concentration, they are prone to um, parasites. So you can see here are sea lice, and um, this is a salmon in this example that's affected by sea lice. And these cause loads of irritation to the fish and can really, really damage their skin and be negative to their well being. And it's also a problem for the producers. Um, so it's something that they do actually want to deal with because it's, it's an economical issue. Um, so for a time, chemicals were used to, to sort of deal with this problem, but these were polluting the waterways. So the producers have now been forced to find other methods to treat sea lice. But unfortunately, these have been um, equally, if not more problematic for fish welfare, unfortunately. And then of course, like intensive systems on the land, um, viruses are a big problem for um, aquatic animals too. So if they're in the water, they can spread it to other animals in the surrounding environment that might swim past the cage. And this is another issue, particularly for salmon farming again, um, because it's causing serious disease issues in the wild salmon populations and it's killing them off. There's also problems um, with vaccinating fishes to, to kind of produ uh, reduce disease, because this often requires taking the fishes out of the water um, one by one to do this. And this is the equivalent of taking your dog, your puppy to the vets for their, um, for their vaccine and holding them under the water to, to administer it. So taking the fishes out of the water they immediately just can't breathe and they essentially start to drown from a lack of oxygen. So it's a highly stressful um, experience for, for the animal to go through. Other stresses include um, environmental stuff, so temperature changes, um, because the animals in these cages or pens are often at the top of the water. So when storms come or it's really hot and they can't escape, in the wild, they would usually swim deeper or seek some sort of shelter, but in these cages, they, they can't do that. So they are exposed to the elements. And there's also poor oxygen levels quite frequently and poor feed quality. And what makes all of this worse is that because so little has been studied about aquatic animals and so much work needs to be done to learn more about what they need, we just don't know enough at the moment to ensure that their welfare is being protected. So these animals are being farmed um, and, you know, if not farmed, they're being taken from the wild. And we don't really know um, a great amount of detail about how to protect each individual species and make sure that they um, make sure that their welfare is prioritized. I also just wanted to talk quickly about an issue that is unique to um, crustaceans. So 
um, particularly prawns that you can see in this picture. And it's something called eye stalk ablation. And basically a female prawn has a hormonal gland behind her eye that moderates reproduction. And this means that the female prawn is only going to breed when the conditions are suitable. And on um, farms, intensive prawn farms, they, the prawn is often very stressed and the crowded conditions on the farms means that the prawn can be really reluctant to reproduce because the conditions just aren't right for her. And unfortunately, um, and very tragically, the way that farmers have sort of learned to deal with this is by cutting the eye of the female prawn in this process known as eye stalk ablation. And this destroys the gland and forces the prawn into rapid sexual maturity. And this is done without anesthetic. And we just have no idea how painful this, this could be for, for the shrimp to endure. I also just wanted to touch on slaughter um, as we're talking about welfare before moving on to the next section. Um, so of course, once aquatic animals have been farmed um, or taken from the wild, they are slaughtered before being um, sold as food. And the welfare of the animal is very rarely considered and is never the priority. So most methods used to kill aquatic animals are inhumane. Um, there has been research done to see how long fishes take to die out of the water. And in some instances, after two whole hours, they were still detecting consciousness in the fish. So this, this, these fishes were just being left to suffocate um, and, and, you know, a really long and drawn out painful death. And this is quite, um, quite commonplace. So live chilling and asphyxiation in the air or on the ice happens all, all the time. And um, it's just a, a highly stressful and painful experience for the animal to go through. There's also gill cutting, which is the rough equivalent of, of cutting the throat. Um, and this, again, unfortunately means that the fish is still conscious when this happens. Um, so again, lots of opportunity for suffering and to feel pain. Some might get a percussive blow to the head to render them unconscious, but this is usually um, after already having been left some time to asphyxiate. So um, there's plenty of scope still for, for suffering. CO2 has been used, so um, CO2 gas, but this is very aversive to, to fishes. The only developed methods that are more slightly more humane if people are going to eat aquatic animals um, and, and going to kill them for their food is electrical stunning. Um, so this is basically where the animal receives an electrical current to the brain and this causes them to lose consciousness. And it's then that they can be um, cut into, but they, they don't feel anything. They're, they're completely unconscious. And even though this is the, the most humane option that we have at the moment, it's not very commonly used because there's an added cost. Um, and then also I just added onto the, to this list, the live boiling of lobsters and crabs. This is still common practice across the world. And given the evidence of crustaceans, um, you know, ability to experience pain, this will likely cause just unthinkable suffering. So given all these welfare issues, why is it so important that we act now to change things for aquatic animals and make sure that the law is on their side? So at the moment, 37 to 120 billion fishes are farmed and slaughtered every single year. So this is quite a wide, wide ranging estimate because um, in aquaculture, individual animals are not actually accounted for. They are um, measured in tons. So this is the, you know, the best estimate that we have. And these are vast numbers of individual sentient beings that are experiencing these, um, these conditions. And this number just dwarfs any other farm species. But perhaps more importantly, and um, kind of proves the need to be acting urgently is that this is increasing every year. 
So in, in line with an increased worldwide demand for, um, for fish and for seafood, um, global production has been increasing too. So it's doubled in volume and it's averaging a 9% yearly increase. And by 2030, um, the World Bank estimates that 62% of all the fish that we eat will be farmed. So the aquaculture industry is really expanding rapidly and it needs to be better regulated and better legal protections in place before it grows and before unfathomable numbers of animals are gonna be part of this system. There's also some uh, slightly concerning developments when it comes to octopuses. So octopuses have traditionally been caught from the wild, but intensive octopus farming has begun too. Um, this is happening on quite a small scale at the moment, um, mostly in Spain, but there are plans for expansion with numerous countries investing in octopus farms. And given all that we've talked about um, with octopus sentience, this is really concerning and problematic um, because octopuses are not meant to be kept in tanks and in close confinement to other, other octopuses. They're quite solitary. They like to be by themselves. Um, and so as this industry starts to take off and grow, it's really important that we um, take action to make sure that they, if we can't stop this industry, we at least make sure that their welfare is protected. Now just to talk a little bit about what the status quo is for um, aquatic animals in the UK. Um, again, I'm going to focus more specifically on farmed aquatic animals because this is my area of work. Um, and also there are more opportunities to regulate and monitor fish farming and aquatic animal farming than there is um, of wild, wild um, fishes. So in the UK, um, Agriculture and therefore aquaculture is a devolved issue and that basically means that there's different legislation in England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, but um, luckily for the purpose of this presentation, they're quite similar um, as they compare. So I will talk quite generally in terms of the UK law, knowing that there is different laws for each country, um, but they, the contents of them are, are, are really much the same. So there's the Animal Welfare Act of 2006. Now, fishes are protected in this as they are vertebrates because this protects vertebrate species. Um, so it doesn't extend to invertebrate aquatic animals. And it offers protection against unnecessary suffering. Now, this is tricky because um, in order to uphold the law, you need to prove that the animal has suffered and there's still this um, problem with people not kind of fully appreciating that the aquatic animals can feel pain. So that's where the first issue lies. There's also a problem with this word unnecessary. So even extreme suffering is sometimes classified as necessary if it's for a legitimate purpose. And unfortunately, intensive farming is viewed as a legitimate purpose. Um, so yeah, this law does not provide too much in the way of protections. There's also specific regulations regards to farming um, and this includes slaughter and transport. And for all of these, the basic principle is there that um, aquatic animals should be protected from an unnecessary suffering, but there is no specific um, guidance, specific legislation with regards to fishes. So they're completely excluded from these detailed farming legislation. Whereas for other farmed animals like chickens, pigs, cows, um, so on and so forth, they all have detailed uh, legislation. So unfortunately in UK law, um, fishes are somewhat behind um, other animals. And then finally, there is the Animal Welfare Sentience Bill that I want to touch on. So we previously, before leaving the EU, so before Brexit, um, we had something called Article 13, which was the EU law that recognises animals as sentient. And when we left the EU, we didn't keep this legislation, 
But last month, the government announced that they're bringing in a new sentience bill, which aims to do the same thing. It wants to recognize animals as sentient beings. And it's quite difficult to know what this is going to mean in practical terms, but it does mean that at least we can challenge the government if they are treating these animals as if they are not sentient. And this bill is being debated as we speak. So just quickly to mention um, the problems with these laws, you can probably tell from, um, from my description of them, but there's the lack of specificity. So the laws are very general, the wording is general, and it's open to, in, open to interpretation, um, which is never a good thing um, because the law needs to be clear and precise in order for people to adhere to it. There's also no guidance for aquatic animals, so it's really hard to know exactly what the legal responsibilities are for farmers. Um, and it's also hard to prosecute them if we think that they are breaking the law. And that means that unfortunately, a lot of welfare relies on industry codes of practice and voluntary means. So in the UK, um, aquatic animal farming has become somewhat of a self-regulated system and therefore, um, then, you know, these producers are not really being held to account for welfare problems. And numerous undercover investigations have actually shown that they're breaking their own codes. And this is my very last section of the presentation. So I realize that we're running ever so slightly over, but I just wanted to very quickly talk about what the Humane League UK is doing to try and change the law in, um, in the UK for farmed fishes specifically. So as I previously mentioned, um, aquaculture is a devolved issue. So we're working with the individual governments in um, England and Wales and Scotland. And we're starting with the legislation at the time of slaughter. So at the moment, fishes lack any detailed slaughter legislation. They're protected by the basic principle, um, which is to be spared unnecessary suffering, but there's no further information or guidance regarding what constitutes an appropriate and humane slaughter to ensure that the time of killing is as stress-free and as pain-free for the fish as possible. Now, we really want to make sure specifically that fishes are being stunned, so rendered unconscious prior to being killed. Now there's evidence that this is actually happening in many cases already in the salmon and the trout farming industries in the UK, which is really good news, um, but it's not happening in all circumstances. Um, so we really wanna make sure that all fishes, regardless of whether they're signed up to um, codes of practice, we wanna make sure that they're all being stunned before slaughter. And we really wanna make sure that this is entrenched in the law because as I've said, um, undercover investigations have shown that voluntary means and the industry regulating itself is not going far enough. Um, they're not holding up to their own standards. So we really need to see a change in the law to make sure that A, it's very clear for farmers what their responsibilities are to protect fish at the time of slaughter. And that B, there's very serious and tangible consequences for people who don't treat fishes properly. And we think that slaughter is a good place to start because the UK government is already aware of it. So this problem has been raised by respected institutions such as the government's own Animal Welfare Committee and the British Veterinary Association. And also seeing as a good portion of the fish farming industry says that it's already doing it, it shouldn't really come at a huge economic cost. So the Humane League is in the middle of lobbying for this change. We're trying to work with the government to bring in this legislation. And we're also need this. And um, this kind of marks the start of a long process for fishes at the Humane League UK. Um, we want to then open up the door to many more welfare improvements. As you can probably tell from this presentation, there's so much more work to be done for fishes and for other aquatic animals, for um, cephalopods, for decapods. Um, so we really wanna make sure that we 
you know, we, we get the ball rolling for this and we make sure that fish are put on the same put on the same level as other land farmed animals because at the moment they're not treated as sentient they're not treated as as worthy as protections as pigs chickens and um, cows are and at the humane league we're really working to change that okay that is everything from me this evening so i really appreciate everybody listening to me and here's my email on the screen if you want to screenshot that or write it down, I'd be really happy for you to reach out to me anytime. Um, but for now, I think we have some questions. So I will stop sharing my screen and hand over to Lou. Great. Thank you so much, Patty, for this very informative presentation. I especially like your um, scientific approach and discussion with regard to fish and aquatic animals. So, um, let's move to our questions our first first question is uh what's your opinion on keeping fishes as pets thank you this is a really good question um my personal opinion is i think it's very important that fishes need to have enrichment so they in the wild they would have so much to occupy them they would have places plenty of space to swim, they would have um, places to hide behind, to forage, to play. They also, you know, some species of fish like to be quite solitary and be by themselves. Others like to um, have other fishes around to just kind of coexist with and to play with. So I think, I'm not sure whether I would keep a fish as a pet, but if I was going to, I think that it would be potentially all right if you had a species that you know was um was you know all right in a kind of restricted area so i think in general fishes do need a lot of space so i think this is very difficult to ensure um but if you were trying you know if you picked a species of fish that migrates for example that is not okay really to keep them because their natural instinct will always be to swim far away and they just can't do that Whereas if you had a fish that that wasn't their natural instinct, that might potentially be better. Um, if you made sure that the tank, as I say, was big enough and it had lots of enrichment for the fish, that they're being fed properly and adequately for the species, that they are either kept alone or with other fish based on what their species required. Um, I think it could be possible that a fish as a pet could have a good quality of life but I really think it can be difficult to know what a species needs. So that's a very complicated answer to the question. It doesn't say yes or no. I think it really does depend um, on, on what the species is and making sure that you try to ensure that um, their environment is as realistic as it could be to the wild, basically. Okay, um, our next question is, uh, Maddie, can you explain a bit about the difference between aquatic animal welfare and rights? Which one of them has a better standing point? Yeah, so this is interesting. It's something that comes up in our work with the Humane League quite a lot because we are known as an animal welfare organization rather than an animal rights organization. And my understanding of it is animal rights is working to ensure that, um, yeah, the animals have, have um, sort of these intrinsic rights that perhaps humans have to, to, you know, to be protected, to not have to suffer, to, some people would even say, to not be eaten, to not be farmed. Um, and these are very fundamental um, things that, that you can sort of fight for for animals that kind of puts them puts them in comparison to humans and really stops this speciesist approach that sees animals as less than humans and sees them as not as worthy. And I'd say that that is more animal rights and animal welfare doesn't take away from animal rights um, because for example, at, at the Humane League UK, we all kind of believe those, those things. We believe that animals um, are deserving of rights. We believe that they're just as important as humans and they deserve to be respected. But the welfare approach um, kind of accepts that at the moment, 
people do eat, eat aquatic animals and they do farm them. And therefore, we want to make sure that their welfare is being protected as much as possible in those systems. So welfare would be to make sure that the stocking density isn't too high or to make sure that, like I said, um, they're being stunned before slaughter. So just these things that you can do to make real tangible improvements to the animal's lives right now. Um, and finally, just in, in, in terms of which one has a better standing point, I think they're both really important. And as I kind of said, the welfare goes into to, to serving the rights and the right is the foundation for the welfare. So I think they go hand in hand. Okay, thank you. Um, another question from one of the attendees. In some countries such as Portugal, for example, domestic animals such as cats or dogs have rights and are no longer seen as an object in legal terms. Is this possible for aquatic animals? Good question. So I think that this, particularly in the UK context with the animal sentience bill, this would mean that, um, you know, fishes are not seen and aquatic animals are not seen as objects. They're, they're being attributed this sentience. The law will say that they are intelligent and they are feeling beings. So in that sense, they won't be treated as objects and they will be, well, not treated rather, they will be spoken of as beings rather than objects. In terms of how they're actually treated on the farms and at the time of slaughter, and also just in society, you know, how they're viewed by people, I think it's, there's a long way to go before aquatic animals are are viewed in, in, in any similar way to what our companion animals are. So, you know, I think just the main issue of the fact that they're still seen as a food for so many people, um, and whether you agree that that's right or wrong, I think that that takes precedence and people see that more than actually seeing the animal for, for, for what it is, for being a sentient being. So I guess my answer is, in legal terms, I think, the wording is there and um you know the animal sentience bill should mean that they're viewed as just as important and just as real and feeling as as dogs and cats are but in terms of the practical side of things i think there's quite a way to go okay um we have a few more questions um what is exact uh, what exactly is the humane league doing to reduce or eliminate consumer demand rather than continuing to support the unnecessary hundreds of billions of death through unenforceable legislation. Are there any alternative livelihoods um, programs in place, perhaps in the seaweed farming industry, which would prevent animals from suffering in these industries? When welfare laws are in place and land animals, not only are most unenforceable on the scale necessary, but they have not changed the lives of animals in any significant way while promoting the idea that <clears throat> there is a humane way to murder someone for a product no one has a nutritional need for. Will this continue with sea life as well through welfare legislation? I think this is a really good question um, and I completely see where the person is coming from because I think that to get legislation for farmed animals is one thing but enforcement is still so poor so um, this person is right that there's laws for like I said pigs and cows and chickens that it exists but in reality on the farms not much is being done to make sure that these animals are being treated in the way that they should be. Um, so I just first want to say that the Humane League is actually a, um, we're not technically a vegan charity, but we do advocate for plant-based, um, a plant-based diet. So as well as working on these welfare reforms, we um, encourage all our supporters to eat vegan and to replace fish with plant-based alternatives. Um, and that's the same for chicken and, and, and all the rest. So if you kind of go onto our social media, it's full of um, recipes and, and, and sharing facts about animal sentience and all the reasons why we shouldn't be eating them in the first place. Um, so yeah, we do have that approach as well as the welfare. We kind of do both hand in hand. In terms of the, um, the legislation with the enforcement, 
I think that this is something that in the UK is still far off from being ideal, but it is getting better. So previously, there was very little in the way of animal law happening in the UK. It was mostly voluntary. And there was barely any paid professionals in the UK working on this. Whereas we've seen in recent years, um, animal law firms such as Advocates for Animals and A-Law springing up and starting to work on issues such as enforcement and really making sure that if these laws exist, they exist for a reason. So animals really are protected. Um, so yes, I completely get what this person is saying. Um, it can seem somewhat futile at times because the laws are not being followed, but I think that that's changing. Okay, um, in your experience, um, what are some of the most effective campaign strategies for aquatic animals? With so many different issues affecting so many different species, it can be overwhelming to know where to start. Any advice you can share on priorities and how to most effectively enhance protections for aquatic animals would be appreciated. Yeah, of course. So it's very true that the species are all so unique and different. Um, so it can be really hard to generalize. So with our work for um, chickens, for example, that is quite straightforward. So if you're saying, for example, you don't want to keep a, a hen in a cage, that is a very simple ask. It's, it applies to the whole species, whereas it's not that simple with, um, with fishes, of course. I think that there are some key welfare issues that apply across the board for, um, for aquatic animals and for fishes. I think the slaughter one is a, is a big one and that's why we're starting there because they all feel pain. So they all deserve the most humane method of slaughter that, you know, if, if people are going to slaughter fish and unfortunately, unfortunately the reality is that they, that they are, um, that's one thing that, that, you know, that applies across the board. I think as well, um, areas such as water quality, that might not sound like a big deal, but the oxygen levels in the water are so important for fish health. Um, so, you know, that's something that applies, although it will change ever so slightly between species, but also stuff like um, making sure that, you know, they're not kept in too close confinement with one another, because if any species of fish is kept in too close confinement, that's going to lead to stress, that's going to lead to um, parasites and diseases. So yeah, that's just like a couple of instances of areas that even though there are some nuances and changes between the different species, generally, very generally speaking, they are things that will benefit pretty much any farmed aquatic animal. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, okay, and we have uh, the last question. Do you really believe there is something called sustainable aquaculture? I love this question because um, no, I don't. <laughs> I really, yeah, me, me personally, and um, I, I, you know, I, I don't always like to speak for the charity if it's not something that we talk about too much. But as I say, we advocate for people to stop eating fish and aquatic animals and animals more generally. Um, I think that aquaculture is sometimes framed as a sustainable alternative to wild fishing, but this is just not true because not only does it have all the problems with intensive farming of other animals, there's also a massive issue that we're taking fishes out of the wild to then feed to farmed animals. So this is in and of itself massively unsustainable. It's so wasteful. Um, and I think even if we move beyond that and didn't feed wild fishes to farmed animals, I, I still just think, yeah, I, I don't, I don't believe that factory farming or intensive farming is is a sustainable practice, or or that it ever will be really. Um. Okay, um, thank you, Maddie, for your wonderful and informative presentation. Uh, we'll be sharing the resources. Um, like Maddie's presentation and also the recording will be available um, soon on our YouTube channel. And uh, keep an eye on our YouTube channel or social media and check out our website. Um, thank you so much for speaking for us today, Maddie. And 
have a great night. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone for watching too. Bye. Bye.